Hello and welcome to Deep Blue Sea, the podcast. I am your host, Jay Clewitt. On this show, myself and my regular co-host, Mark Hoffman, have been through the entire Deep Blue Sea franchise trilogy, scene by scene. Now looking at some Deep Blue Sea adjacent films, that's films featuring uh, aquatic action, sharks, or directed by Rennie Harlan. And this is one of those uh, Mark Three episodes where um, we're going through the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. We're up to the fourth one, Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides. Released in 2011, uh, directed by Rob Marshall, the first Paul Verbinski free uh, uh, outing. It's also free of um, um, some of the main characters. We only have uh, Johnny Depp, uh, uh, Jeffrey Rush, and Kevin McNally are the only ones kind of returning. And the monkey, I guess, but who cares? It's, it's a belly in it. Um, this is mainly about the search for the, the Fountain of Youth, led by Blackbeard, Captain Blackbeard. Uh, they play Ian McShane, along with Angelica, who might be his daughter, though, but you know, the Penelope of the Cruise, starring in Pirates of the Caribbean, and a bunch of other people tagging along in lots and roles that we'll get to. I said we. Who is this we? Well, of course, I have a guest joining me for this whole franchise, and, and he has a name. It's Nick Rehack. Nick, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you for having me back, man. Thrilled to have you here. As we were just discussing, we cannot wait to talk about this film. It's a to... <laughs> real barn burner of an episode. Yeah, yeah you're, you've had a, a power out today. Yeah. I've had an exceptionally busy week. Everything is stacking up to not let us talk about this film. Yet we have prevailed. We have persevered mm-hmm. and we are here. Who knows what Skype's going to throw at us throughout this recording? <laughs> Who <laughs> really knows? Because it's been dicey. It has. The, the last 10 to 15 minutes of every episode you and I have recorded together yeah. has been problematic. <laughs> Just awful. Uh, so let's let's get into this uh, this film. So, uh, um, not a, not a, not a great one. I was going to come out mm-hmm. on the bat and say not a great uh, film. This one is it's Captain Jack Sparrow is very much the lead character here, where he's been uh, at, the very, at the least part of a lead trio in the past. Here it's the Captain Jack Sparrow show. With supporting roles of Jeffrey Rush as Captain Bobosa a little bit, and Penelope Cruz a bit, and Ian McShane barely. But it's the Captain Jack show, and they, they, they uh, I don't like that. I don't like that to be the case. I like when he's sharing that spotlight, and here it's it's his. And they, the characters he would be sharing that with are rubbish. The new ones they bring in, they're not great. I mean, can you even remember their names? They don't even really focus on them in the film. It's just like, oh yeah, this. Oh, we forgot this person's in here. I mean, oh, I'm, I'm looking at the this Wikipedia person's page. Still here. Yeah, Do I'm looking at the Wikipedia page, so I can remember their names. But I am now learning that Sam Clapton's character had a name. Uh, <laughs> his name was See? Philip Cube Swift. Uh, but didn't didn't know that. Uh, I'm not sure it's ever said. Oh. Pretty said that a couple of times, but who, who, yeah. And like Penelope Cruz, okay, let, let's let's go through the newcomers to this cast because I feel like this is if we were to go through the plot, it would take us a long time this time. Mm-hmm. So let's let's go through these these new characters. So first up, we have Penelope Cruz as Angelica. Not her yes. first time working with Johnny Depp. They were in Blow together and other things. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, what did, what did you think about? Uh, I assume her name is Angelica Blackbeard. Or Angelica Teej, really. <laughs> what do you think about about Penelope One of the two. Angelica. I I felt they had really good chemistry. I felt like any time Johnny Depp looked at looked at her and reacted to her and what she was saying or doing, like his reactions were genuine. There's a moment when uh, later on in the film they're trudging through the woods and as Angelica goes to take a step, a sword comes out of her neck, and she kind of turns to the side off camera and she's like. You know, why is it every time we see each other, you've always got something pointing at me? And then it cuts to, you know, Jack Sparrow. He's holding the sword to her throat and everything. And he's just got this coy little smile that feels like such a real smile, as if she was supposed to say something else and ad lib that line. And just, I don't know, there's a really great chemistry there. Yeah, I I, I agree. They work well together. They, they would then go on to be in uh, the Murder on the Orient Express together as well. They're not ready together that much, uh, so I feel like they are friends, or they work they work well together, and mm-hmm. that 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 shows in the chemistry. 
I just wish that there was a little more for her. I wish her character was a bit better. Because, well, there's not. I didn't. I think there's. I don't think there's a lot there. So she's introduced as as being there's someone out there pretending to be Jack trying to recruit a crew, and and so there's this sword sword fight where there's a scene where they keep her in shadow. Like, oh, who's mm-hmm. it going to be? Is is it like another captain? Is it Johnny Depp again? And there's this, oh, and it's it's Penelope Cruz. <laughs> and, um, what a beard! <laughs> I, I feel like half of that was to be like, aha, reveal. But then she's on the poster, she's on all the marketing, you kind of know. But I looked into it, and the other half of that is uh, she was very heavily pregnant for a lot of the filming of this. And she, like, they, they found out she was pregnant not long before they started shooting. Uh, so they immediately did all of her close up work. And then she did not do any of her stunt work or much of her stunt work. And lots of huh. her, lo- lots of the long shots of her uh, in the film, uh, she's doubled by her sister. So it's not, it's not always Penelope Cruz. So she got yeah. paid millions of dollars <laughs> for very little. This is like what? an Aaron Rodgers type <laughs> season here. I, I'm, I'm not gonna belittle everything she did. I'm sure she did a, a lot of work, uh, but she didn't do everything. <laughs> Shall we say? But yes, I, I I feel like she got paid a lot. It would make sense that she got paid a lot because this was, at the time it was made, the most expensive film ever made. Jeez. Uh, which, what? T- to be fair, uh, this is the third time that that has happened with this franchise. <laughs> Dead Man's Chest and At World's End were also the most expensive films ever made. Uh, Dead Man's Chest cost two hundred twenty-five million dollars. At World's End three hundred. What? And this one. Three hundred and seventy-nine million dollars. Shut the hell this up! Is... This is a three hundred and eighty million dollar movie that no one remembers. Right. I mean, this is this is according to Wikipedia that they have little asterisks next to all these figures of being like estimated. We think. We think. So this is to date the second most expensive film ever made, after Star Wars: The Force Awakens, which cost oh. four hundred and forty-seven million dollars. Oh but... my gosh! <laughs> it's, yeah, it's an extra. Like seventy on top of this one, but oh my. where uh, Pirates Caribbean from Stranger Sides made, you know, a hair over a billion. It's too much for a film that, as you say, no one really remembers. Uh, Force Awakens <laughs> made a hair over two billion, so that extra seventy million dollars spent went went a fair amount, went a fair way. Uh, uh, so I'm just uh, this is the thing. This is we were going to get to this later, but we're on it now. I don't know where that money went. You know what they did? They spent it muddying the film. This is a dark movie. Not dark as in tone. Not dark as in a lot of night scenes. I mean, I had to turn the brightness up on my television just to kind of see what was genuinely happening. There's so – it's just so – it's so dark and muddy, and it just takes away from, like, the vibrant – and excitement of the other films. I know this isn't trying to be the other films. I know it's trying to be and do its own thing. But just still have that vibrant. Have something that's keeping me awake and keeping my attention. There's a, a lot of, of nighttime scenes, definitely. A lot of stuff happening in, in the murk. And even stuff that's happening in daylight is like overcast. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's yeah. So, so little in sunlight. I mean, to be fair, it starts in London. Famously cloudy. I, I get that. But still, you can... The sun does shine now. We're in it. We've just had a heat wave. Uh, so... But just in, like comparing this one to the previous ones, at World's End and Dead Man's Chest, there's a lot of money on screen. There's a lot of giant set pieces and like think about the, we we love the wheel sword fight in in Dead Man's yeah. Chest. We love that scene. Best scene of the franchise. Yeah, that's an expensive looking scene to shot because that's a, a lot of practicality. There's gonna be a lot of stunt work, a lot of stuff going on on screen. Meanwhile, that that fantastic CGI that still holds up all the all the David Jones's men running around. Yes. Compare that to on Stranger Tides. There's not a single set piece that stands up to, against that. There's a couple, like the the London chase at the start. There's there's some fun stuff in there. Uh, there's like he's surfing on top of a carriage, like Teen Wolf. There's some swinging around. Uh, there's I a mean, Judy it's... Dench cameo. <laughs> so I'm even I'm like, is that Judy Dench? That's Judy that... Dench. <laughs> there, I think they're bigger and grander, truly in just scope. And size of what they're doing, but it's not grander or more exciting an idea than the wheel. Like I, yeah. 
And even the effects work in this, not great. No. I mean, like, the, the, the biggest effect great. stuff is going to be the, the mermaids. Yeah. They're mostly CGI, and there's a lot of them flailing around. And, but it's all so dark and murky. <laughs> and mm-hmm. So I, I just, unless Johnny Depp was like, I demand $150 million for this film, I don't see where that money went. That's, uh, but this is, I was, I was looking at the list of other most expensive films I've made, and we have, outside of the Pirates films, we have covered one more. You were not on that show. Uh, but which Rennie Harlan film do you think was the most expensive film ever made when it was released? Well, I can think it was Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> well, so you didn't talk about it here, but you have talked about it elsewhere. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, oh, <laughs> uh, Con Air. No, that's not Rennie Harlan. That's Simon West. Uh, Why Die do Hard I keep two. thinking that's Rennie Harlan? Because, I mean, it, it, it could be. Die Hard 2. Die Harder was... Really? The most expensive film ever made uh, in 1990. Total Recall came out and claimed that title. And then just <laughs> after Die Hard 2 came out and, and nicked it. Uh, for one year, and then turn over two, game that titles. Uh, Arnold's coming for it, man. Yeah, uh, the the Die Hard two Die Hard two cost somewhere between sixty two to seventy million dollars. Rennie Harlan had a lot of bad luck filming that, and you can hear a lot more about it. Listen to Movie Rob Minute where he's going through Die Hard two minute by minute, which you were recently on. <laughs> I hey, on well. that's me. I, I was on the first week. I'll be on the last minute, and you were on a week between. I think Mark is due to be coming up pretty soon on that show at time of recording as well. Nice. As indeed have most of the a lot of the guests we've had on this show crop up on it as well. Because Rob and I sample from the same pool. At the time of this recording, uh, in like three or four days, I'm recording for Rob's next project. So. I have already done that. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us, huh? <laughs> Swimming I mean, in the pool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't diversify his guests all that much. He has the same ones every time. And that's hey, fun. if it works, it works. <laughs> so um. And there are a bunch of other most expensive films ever made that we will eventually cover on this show because when you film things on the water, it gets expensive. That's what happens. Don't do it. It doesn't work. Uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing... I want something to cost more than The Force Awakens did. I, I thought like the, the Avengers films would have done that, but they they, they didn't uh, say that most expensive. They are expensive, but they never, the, they never uh, got that Doom, most expensive. Dune 2, those didn't? I, I don't think so. Uh, there, look, there's a list of the top uh, like 75. The one of the Mission Impossibles has to be up there. This one or the next one, whatever, part two. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 is the 15th most expensive film ever made. It cost around $291 million. So more than <laughs> Solo, more than Jurassic World Dominion. Uh, less than The Dial of Destiny, Indiana Jones and Dial of Destiny. Well, that's all um, that CGI work. That's all that CGI, yeah. But uh, less than World's then. End. Less than World's End, less than Strange Tides. Uh, the Irishman, I feel like that CGI didn't cost that much. Uh, if you're looking at it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Got him. <laughs> that's mean. I'm sure <laughs> Take of, that, Scorsese. <laughs> a lot of people did some fine work on that film, I'm sure. I just didn't really care for it that much. It's yeah, too long. It's, it's a four-hour film where... Yeah, he's supposed to be young, but he, he moves like an old man. Anyway, it, yeah, it is kind of weird. Uh, so, speaking of uh, moving like an old man, uh, Ian McShane is yes. Uh, <laughs> it's the film as Blackbeard. No offense, Ian McShane. I love Ian McShane. What do you think about him as as, as Blackbeard? Lifting the Queen Anne's Revenge. All I wanted was essentially a pirate version of Al Swearingen, and that's what I got. And I liked it. I love Ian McShane in Deadwood. I think he's great. Anything he's in, I'm there and I enjoy it. And I absolutely loved his performance. I wish they gave him, I don't know, a better movie to be in. (laughs) Uh, Because even with him, I'm like, when does he come? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. And I mean, his entrance is is fantastic. And the way he just presents himself up front is like, oh, no, this guy's psychotic. Like, this guy is crazy bad guy. Uh, I just, I wish they gave him a better film to be in. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm trying to think back at, like, I've seen this film twice in the past week. So I'm trying to think back, like, what's some great Ian McShane moments in uh, Stranger Tides? I'm like, well, when he comes out, because uh, they're all like, Blackbeard's not on this ship. It's mutiny. The ship's ours. 
Bands and uh, sorry, uh, Captain Jack's like, and Blackbeard's not there's no Blackbeard around, and then he comes up from behind. Beautiful moment, and then he's got that magic sword that can control the boat. And I'm like, oh, I feel like this is something I should have remembered from the first time I saw this film. It's, it feels like it's pretty cool. We're going to see a lot of this in the film, and it's cool. It's weird. Uh, I haven't looked into the the backstory, the mythology of Blackbeard. Uh, a real guy, uh, but <laughs> I'm pr- pretty sure that's not real. And it's pretty in the mythology somewhere, but that's a sword that can control the ropes and the sails and the, the giant flamethrowers on the front of the ship. Cool. And the yeah, other it's... bit I really liked that he did was when he died. <laughs> the the ending, the when he when he dies in the uh, the fountain of youth whirlwind. Mm-hmm. Like males is like he's like he's like a blender and he gets ripped yeah. out of a skeleton. That's a just pretty immediately too. Death. It's pretty awesome death. It really uh, is, and I kind of wish there would have been like hunks and skin flaps everywhere, but I guess it gets sucked <laughs> in like as part of the whirlpool. I, I guess I just wanted a little bit more color and excitement out of it. Yeah, I, I just think yeah, you know, there's not a lot of uh, badass deaths in this film. I'm a fan of. Uh, fun deaths in movies. Listeners will know that. <laughs> um, you know, the original plan for Deeper Sea was Mark and I were going to go through it death by death. And uh, we decided not to do that. <laughs> Break the film into 13 jokes. Uh, it would have been unbalanced. It'd be like a, a 20 minute opening section waiting for that tiger shark to die. <laughs> and, and then make some little bits here and there. And then credits. Uh, so it worked out nicer doing it this way. Uh, but yeah, that's. It's a fun death. In between. Like I said, I, I love Ian McShane too. I haven't seen Deadwood. Uh, I watched the first episode. But my wife didn't like it, and I've not found the time to go back and watch it without her. Because uh, there's too much TV. But I have the box set. I'm going to watch it at some point. I just haven't seen Deadwood yet. And uh, You'll get I, there. Yeah, and I'll, then I'll, you'll I'll absolutely there. love it. I mean, the aforementioned movie, Rob, uh, last year for my birthday, he, he bought me the Quantum Leap box set. Because it sounds like a show I would love and I've never seen. And, you know, I still haven't watched it. I'm very, <laughs> gra- I'm very grateful they gave it to me. But it's just too much TV. There's too much to watch. I have too many. It's a lot. Deep Blue Sea adjacent films to watch every week. I have never watched them. I'm not sure I would love Quantum Leap. But they'll, they'll come a time. It's going to get watched. Thank you. Yeah. You'll uh, get so, so, yeah, I would have liked a better film for me. Like, if you'd have... Ian McShane was originally up for uh, Davy Jones. Well, he was considered for Davy Jones in Dead Man's Chest. I feel like he would have been a good Barbosa as well. He just feels yeah. the right kind of guy to be playing a pirate. Yeah, it works. he really does. He could he could easily have played uh, Jack Sparrow's dad as well. That's he. Yeah, he'd have been a really good Captain Teague. Yeah. Uh but as it is, he's great. As he's fantastic at Blackbeard, we just want more for him to do in better, yeah. in better film. It's, it's, it's a shame. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. So and the fact that this is he's like one and done. He he's introduced here and then killed. So it's not like he's gonna be coming back, I assume. Yeah, we have one more pirates film to do. I can't remember mm-hmm. anything. I'm looking forward to refreshing myself as to what's <laughs> what happens in that film. I'm sure something does. Uh so those are the two like main newcomers, but we also have Sam Claflin as Philip Swift, who is a missionary aboard Blackbeard's ship. We introduced to him and he's like tied up in the rigging. I, I'm a fan of Sam Claflin. I don't particularly. I, I have my problems with the pirate of the uh, the uh, Hunger Games films. Mm. One of those problems has never been Sam Claflin. He's fantastic. He's the best part of them, in my opinion. Finnick O'Dare is a delight. Uh, he's basically uh, Errol Flynn in those films, and I really he's like a, he's like a trident, and he's pretty cool. Uh, and so whenever he's he's got a lot of charisma. Uh, whenever he crops up and stuff, I'm like, oh, great, Sam Claflin. I didn't feel that in this one. This is his first film. This is uh, his, his first ever film. And I'm shocked that he made more. Because <laughs> he gets does nothing to do other than just be sad and dour. And complain. And he's a coward! That's uh, uh, Blackbeard. And they didn't care for him one bit. Yeah, I, he think? was just... Yeah, no, exactly that. I'm just like, can we get rid of this guy? Can we, all right, hurry up and get over your bits so we can get back to whatever we're doing here instead. <laughs> like, it's just, 
it it was it felt like filler. It didn't even feel like a fully fleshed out like character or, or an idea. It just felt like a way to move the plot annoyingly. Yeah, because we we never really know what he wants. We just know that he isn't a fan of Blackbeard. He, he's because Blackbeard's like doing unchristian things, and so he's just a, he's not a fan of people doing unchristian things. They're all That's, doing unchristian things. Right. <laughs> They're pirates. <laughs> yeah. When. Uh, yeah, we'll get we'll get to the Spanish when they show up. But I feel like there should be a scene where they're doing things in the name of of Christ, and, and he should. That's when Batman's character should be like, "Oh, I'll come and join you guys. I want your team." But that, that doesn't, they never really interact. Uh, so yeah, he's just he's just there to be a, a character in amongst the the crew. And then when we have the mermaid shows up, they have like a little relationship, but it's never it's it's. Okay, so Astrid Burgess Frisbee is uh, Serena, the mermaid. They, they, mm-hmm. they need a mermaid's tears for the ritual, in capital letters, uh, that they have to undertake at the Fountain of Youth. And so they capture a mermaid, Serena. And that's who Astrid Burgess Frisbee plays. She is uh, a model. She hasn't done a lot of acting. This is also her first film, I believe. It is not. This is her sixth film. Okay. Um, she also doesn't get much to do other than be sad and annoyed at the situation. Uh, to shame. What do, what did you think about her? No, the exact same thing. It's just when it's like we get it, we we get it, we understand what you two are doing. We get just move on, please. I don't want this. No one asked for this. There's no need for it. You could probably cut it out of the film, and things would still be okay. Like you could find a way to move the plot to the next point without like any issue. It, it just felt, I don't know. It felt like a waste. It felt like somebody won a bet and they had to include the mermaids for some reason. Yeah, it could be, it's part of the ritual. Sure. But you could have done so many other different things and not included mermaids and saved them for another day or just, I don't know, not included mermaids at all. Well, yeah, cause they have the, they have the ritual of the needed mermaids tier in the, this is basically a, a, a find the thing. So it's another fetch quest. Um, so we need to get the silver challenges from Ponsiglion. We need a mermaid's tear. And we need to get to the holy, the holy grail, the fountain of youth. And when we get there, we have to put some fountain water in both chalices. One has a teardrop in it. Two people drink it. The other drinks the one with the tear, lives, and they suck the life from the one who drinks the one without the tear. Yeah, but uh, they could have figured out something other than the tear and taken out all the mermaid stuff. You know what I mean? Like it could, yeah. you know, like a piece of eight or just something that like kind of harkens back to what's already been introduced within like the franchise in that world. Just, just something. Not, not yeah. this mermaid stuff that well, just well, feels was, so unnecessary. What I was going to suggest was if, if they insisted on it being a mermaid, because I do think that is, I heard somewhere that is kind of part of the law. That there is the, the Phantom of Youth Mermaid's Tear. That's not something that was made up for this film. That already exists. This is based on a book. Feels like it. And I feel like they could have had that mermaid put in there, but just been like, they capture a mermaid, she cries, and then they kill her. And they just, I mean, she's not like part something. of something. I mean, that's <laughs> super brutal and, and nightmarish, but well, she gets away. I feel like that would she be more and gets away. Uh, because she cries. She, she, no, she, she cries, and then she gets away. Uh, oh, but, okay. Um, but they they kind of try and tie her and Sam Clapton's character, who again apparently has a name, but Sam Clapton's character. They <laughs> tie them into the finale with, with with at the fountain because the the chalices get destroyed, so she has to swim down and get them, and then she gives she gives them to Jack. And I don't don't waste my tear, but it's never explained why she's given them to Jack because Jack has done. Very little to help and to be to earn this, because he's like, the main character, Jay. That's why. <laughs> this is, right, <laughs> and in the same way, like I don't quite understand why uh, Serena and Bufflin kind of fall for each other, because he's just like helping her when she's in need. Because they have this uh, glass coffin, essentially glass casket full of water that she survives in once they carry it. Like, there are four guys carrying it. I'm thinking this must be even without the water in it. This has got to be the heaviest thing ever made. Yeah. Like, this thick glass coffin, casket, with a mermaid in it, full of water. Just can you imagine 
lifting a full bath with a person in it? No. Even with three other people? Not. <laughs> absolutely not. The weight dispersal alone would be a nightmare. So then it turns out that she can survive outside of that. She just can't walk. And I'd be, if I'd been any of the people that had carried her at any point, I would have been furious. I'd have shot her. <laughs> like, at any point, you should have told us this. It would have been easier for everyone involved. Like, I, I get you can't walk, but it's so much easier to carry one you as opposed to one you in six glass casket full of water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I... Just take turns giving her a piggyback. So they, they they have this relationship that ends so unsatisfyingly. He he gets injured and she kind of gets away and he comes back and like I I can save you but you have to like ask me to and forgive me or whatever and he's like fine yes and then she drags him down underwater and we never see them again. Yeah, <laughs> they just disappear down into the depths. We when the mermaids are introduced, we have the character saying ah the mermaids they'll they'll try they'll lure you in their sirens or their their song and their kissing etc and then. Or they'll they'll drag you down into water and eat you, and the film ends with her dragging him down into water. Disappeared. To assume she ate him. Just that's what we've been told. So this yeah, film works. Just steady crushed him. Yeah. And then like the characters don't even really like acknowledge that they're gone. Nope. Or or no that it even mattered. Well, I mean, I I feel like a lot of unnamed characters die. In the sword fighting around the fountain of youth, so people just assume, oh, the missionary guy, yeah, he must have. Nah, see, he, he got stabbed and wandered off. He, he's dead somewhere. Gotta be. And the mermaid, who cares? Mermaid, try to eat us. Uh, so then we have we have newcomers in the crew uh, because the likes of uh, Rigetti and uh, the other one, I can't remember his name. Uh, they aren't here. And presumably, there there is a miniature. The the black pearl has been miniaturized and put in a bottle, and the little monkey is now an even little monkey on the ship. Is there a little Rigetti on that ship? Is there any of the crew still in there, in like borrower fashion now? Teeny tiny wooden eye rolling around. Absolutely, like better so. be. Yeah. Uh, so, but amongst the, the newcomers to the crew, we have Stephen Graham. I'm a fan of Stephen Graham. He's always great in everything, uh, apart from this. Uh, in which he plays Scrum, who is described on Wikipedia as a self-serving crew member of the Queen Anne's Revenge. But actually, fact, he's just a dumb pirate. He's just a guy who's, who's like a bit silly. And doesn't get... Actually, he he gets quite a bit to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but nothing nothing good uh, that I can recall. <laughs> he, yeah, he's it's just... just so bland and underwhelming. Like you, any I'm, I enjoy any and everything he's in. But I see this and I'm just like, come on, man. You know you're better than this. Like, where's the director going, Steven? Come on, you know you can do. Like, where's the... <sighs> it's, it's disappointing. I, I think I first saw him in Snatch. He's Tommy. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Jason Statham's buddy. He's fantastic in that, playing very, very uh, simple guy. But then he's cropped up in, like, This Is England. He's, ac- he's excellent, This Is England. He's been in a lot of great stuff. He was. Did you see a Boiling Point? From a couple of years ago, um, I don't think I did. No. Where it's a it's a one take film, all set in okay. a, a British kitchen, and he's the head chef. Oh, interesting! Uh, it's really tense. It's like eighty minutes long, <laughs> uh, good. and um, like Jason Fleming's in it as a as a critic. Uh, you know, they're, they're mates from Guy Ritchie films. Not a lot of uh, recognizable people, um, but like Stephen Graham and Jason Fleming are the two that I recognize. There's a couple a couple of like cropped up on East Enders and stuff. Uh, but it's I, I recommend it. It's a very uh, frustrating, intense film, uh, but it's it's worth your time. I think it was on Netflix. Yeah, I'm not sure where it is elsewhere in the world. But Boiling Point, check it out. It's from it was a short film in 2019, but then the one that I watched is from 2021. I think so. Okay. Mid, mid-pandemic kind of watch. Uh, so that's so yeah. So he's he's scrum and he like he's playing the guitar at one point during a. A tango sequence between Jack and, and Angel- Angelica, which is odd scene. Uh, and then he he goes to kiss the mermaid. Like, there's nothing much has really happened in Scrum's life, but I want to go down as the guy who kissed a real life mermaid and then got eaten by her. Uh, this to me, he doesn't doesn't. And like he's present in a lot of the key scenes, like when they when Jack and and Angelica are fighting over the. Chalice is at the end. He's the third member in that tussle, pointing towards each other. I'm like, why? Yeah, Hell yeah. 
Jack said, like, let's not fight about this. Everyone calm down. And you were like, yeah. <laughs> and now you're fighting about it for someone else. What do you... I don't quite understand. Uh, Unless that was originally supposed to be Philip, but then they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. We killed him. I guess we'll just swap him out. Hey, Steven, get over here. Could be. Could be. Either way, I expected... I was like, ah, oh, Steven Graham! But I expected more. I know that he is in the next <laughs> one. Because uh, there's been... See, scenes crop up on my YouTube recommendations that he's in and work from this film, so we'll we'll have more of him soon. And uh, amongst the other, rest of the crew, one other that stood out for me that I recognised is a guy called Christopher Fairbanks, uh, who uh, I've talked about him on podcasts before. He was from a a UK TV show called Alfida Zane Pet. Uh, I'm just yeah, Christopher Fairbanks. Um, he, he's like the older guy on on the on the crew here, where when they talk about mermaids, he's the one who gives them the cautionary tale, like ah, no mermaids, they'll kill you. Okay. He, he's also in the Guardians of the Galaxy films. He's like the the broker that they go to try to trade. The, um, oh the... yeah, 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 with like a dozen eyebrows or something like that. Yes, exactly. Yes, very very much eyebrow. He apparently is also in like Rob Marshall, director of this film, have made the Little Mermaid. <laughs> This this year's Little Mummy, uh, a film that we will eventually what? cover on this show. I'm certain. Yes, he's apparently in that as well. Same yeah. guy that did um, Chicago, right? Yes, yes. His one good film uh, was, was Chicago. And then that is ins- how do you... <laughs> so... you you direct a film like Chicago and then you deliver this? That's, this is it. He made Chicago. Like... Chicago was great. He then made Memoirs of a Geisha, which admittedly okay. I haven't seen. He then made Nine. Nine is awful. He then made On Stranger Tides. Not a good film. He made Into the Woods. Not a good film. He made Mary Poppins Returns. I like it. I like Mary Poppins Returns. Fair enough. But he shouldn't have made it because he had made three terrible films before that. He should not. Yeah, how is... like, at, at some point after 2014, he should have stopped being able to make films. They should, someone should have said, no, Rob Marshall, sit down. Let someone else have a chance at this. Some, someone else can make Mary Poppins Returns. Anyone else. But he made it and he did a fine, he did a fine job. Other people probably could have done a better job. I feel like uh, Mary Poppins, one of my childhood films, that, and Returns gets by on a lot of nostalgia for me. Bearing in mind, I have not watched it again since the cinema. So I saw it once and thought, yeah, I really like that. I'm never going to think about it ever again. Um, <laughs> and now, I, I didn't know he'd made The Little Mermaid until looking into it for this podcast. And I was like, oh, you again? <laughs> Stop making films, you fool. Uh, but he keeps on, they keep making money, I guess. I just wish they didn't. I don't know how. Yeah. I don't know how in what world they're making money, but people well, like, are still seeing them. I mean, the one we're talking about today made over a billion dollars. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Christopher Fairbank is, is in that as well. But he was in a show called Alfie Zane Pet, which I never saw the original series because it came out uh, uh, before my time. Mm. Uh, but from what I, I'm aware of, it was like seven guys from the north of England who uh, formed a company where they had to um, take a bridge from somewhere and set up somewhere else. Oh, no, sorry. Sorry, in the first season, they all, there's seven British guys who just go to Germany and work on a construction site in Germany and have, like, some culture shock. And then they bought it back. This is from the 80s. They bought it back in the 2000s where they then had to relocate a bridge. And that one of them passed away so his son had joined them uh, his son was played by no no clark uh, hmm. but these were all this is an, an 80s show in england so they're all white guys of a certain age <laughs> and so there's a lot of controversy like wait a minute your kids no clark oh no no and all, all the all seven actors have had very different careers uh hmm. the most notable timothy spool okay Timothy's yeah Paul. i like him yeah, he's great. He's the the character actor. He's, uh, he's I think he's not in for an Oscar, but he's excellent in everything. Less notable in the cast, you have Jimmy Nail. Have you heard of Jimmy Nail? Uh, no, that sounds no. like a make believe name. I'm, I'm certain it's not his his real name, but he's uh, yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a fun guy. <laughs> uh, but he he also has like a music career that I don't think is terribly good. Uh, yeah, like Kevin Waitley, who's been in. A, a TV crime drama for many years in the UK. One of those detective shows. Pat Roach. Do you know Pat Roach? 
Not ringing any bells. Okay, you have seen Pat Roach in many films, most noticeably uh, the Indiana Jones trilogy, in which he's the guy who gets taken out by the plane in Raiders of the Last Ark. The big guy, old, oh, him. barrel okay. chested. Yeah. yeah, he's in all three of those first Indiana Jones films, uh, getting killed in various ways. He gets taken out on the uh, conveyor belt in Temple of Doom, which has voodoo, as does this film. Uh, but in that film, he's wearing a turban and kind of brown face. So we don't talk about that as much. Uh, uh, but yeah, Pat Roach is just fun in these films. He plays like a big dumb guy. Uh, but I, I've, I've kind of seen a season of this show and it's just stuck with me. And so whenever I see Christopher Lang and stuff, I'm like, hey, it's that guy. He was in the Fifth <laughs> Element as well. Uh, and so it's just see, it's watching, he's like when uh, 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 in, in Fifth Element when they're like wrapping the, the tape around uh, mm. Lilu. And he he's the guy who's like, oh, pictures. <laughs> Give me some pictures of this. He's like a real creepy guy. And now he's playing an old pirate in Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, great. You again. Who also uh, kind of comes across as a creepy guy. Yeah, sure. I mean, he's, he's an old pirate. I feel like it comes in the territory. Uh, but this has been a Crystal Fairbank uh, diversion. You're all welcome. So outside of the, the crew, we have some cameos, or like one scene guys. We have Richard Griffiths as King George II. Uh, Richard Griffiths no longer with us. Uh, obviously Vernon Dursley from the Harry Potter films. Uncle Monty and Withnail and I. And he's playing King George II here as a child. As like a, yeah, pretty much. As like a giant baby. And I think it's fantastic. One of, one of my highlights of the film is just what, what he does as this terrible king. Did you like him? I like him. And what I kind of like is you could definitely tell the writers are like, let's make him an idiot. And he's like, all right, you want me to play this straight? You want me to play this? Like, just be a big idiot. And he's like, (laughs) okay. (laughs) You asked for it. Here we go. So when when, like Jack escapes his clutches and Barbosa is like, I'll handle it. The little clenched fist he gives is just pure. His hands. (laughs) It's pure. I'm a baby. (laughs) Attend to me. I've made a mess in my diaper. Yeah. Oh, he got away. It's we'll go get him right now. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's how all, all members of the royal family act. It's, <laughs> give me my... <laughs> and he's he's attended to by uh, Roger Allen and uh, Anton Lesser as Anton, Roger Allen playing the prime minister uh, Henry Pelham at the time, and Anton Lesser is uh, Lord John Carteret, guy I've never heard of. Uh, but they're two British characters that like crop up in things. Uh, Anton Lesser was in Game of Thrones as uh, he's Quyburn, and uh, the Meester in the second season or the latter seasons. Oh, and Roger, okay, yeah, yeah. Roger Adams is in a bunch of loads of everything. Every British TV show he's been on. It. Uh, so they have one scene, but then as we mentioned before, Judy Dench, Dame Judy Dench, is like in a twenty-second cameo where she's riding through a carriage that Johnny, Johnny Depp swings into and starts like making out with her neck. Steals an earring. snogging on her for sure. Yeah, so like st- steals an earring with his teeth. Uh, departs. Oh, She's like, "Oh, is that it?" And then that is it. We don't, we don't see her again for the rest of the film. And that earring that he stole doesn't come up either. Uh, yeah, it, like ever again. It feels like they shot that scene where he goes into a carriage, leave, and goes somewhere else, and then Judy Dench walk past the set, and they're like, oh, hey, come over for Judy. No, sit, sit, <laughs> watch her, sit down. Let's get a dress for you. 20 minutes your time. It's, and they just shot it, and then that was it. That is a very odd... I was watching it, and I wait, wait a minute. What is this? It's such a bizarre scene. Yeah, because it happens, and as long as you know who Dame Judi Dench is, it's funny. Or it's at least notable or comical. And if you don't, it's you're just like, what? Like, okay. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, and then so we have other other than those newcomers, we have the returning Johnny Depp, Kevin McNally, and uh, uh, Jeffrey Rush. Uh, McNally and Jack are doing the same odd things, maybe a little sleepier than usual. Uh, Jeffrey Rush, it felt so bad seeing him as as Barbosa here, where he's it now did. It, he's he's not Captain Barbosa. He's now working for the Crown, neutered, powdered face. How did he looks terrible? Uh, yeah, it was like caricature, Albo Barbosa, like just 
and uh, he, he he it's it's all a play you know it's all like working for the crown to get to, so he can get to blackbeard so he can get the ship back it's all it's all it's all a, a kind of an act but it's still so just unsatisfying watching him be like no no we don't drink not not today we just we work for the crown with king's men i was like no you're barbosa and at the, at the very end he's like oh you lily livered sparrow what or whatever it is like he gets back into it so we have like 15 seconds of yes barbosa in this uh two hours and 19 minute film uh still it's too long uh, yeah it's just it's it's disappointing it's like watching undertaker go almost undefeated and then he loses his final wrestlemania like don't don't do that to the man he deserved so much better than what you're giving him and i don't know it just felt it felt like a lesser than version and it didn't feel right like you said it hurt to watch yeah, so I'm going to agree with that reference, wrestling reference, as if I understand <laughs> anything you just said. <laughs> I was once, uh, uh, DJ Valentine asked me to record a little bit for the Some Pacific Reviews podcast uh, as, oh, I, don't remember the, I don't remember the guy's name. Like, um, this is terrible. Uh, as the, the the main wrestling promoter. Uh, who's, Vince who's like, McMahon? Yes, as Vince I, I, he sent me a message and, he's, and I was like, oh, who is Vince McMahon? I don't. Because <laughs> uh, um, I'd never heard of this guy. And I looked at some YouTube videos and go, oh, sure, I'll see what I can do. And that's that's the only wrestling I've ever seen. Is... That is absolutely. <laughs> who is Vince McMahon? <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. R- wrestling is one of those things that just kind of passed me by. I was like, I had some friends who liked it. But it always mm-hmm. seemed like, what, what is this? Is this sport? Kind of. Is, is this made up? Certainly. Am I going to watch it? No. It, it feels like <laughs> the, the intersection of sport and reality TV, uh, neither of which I care for. So. <laughs> it was like a soap opera for guys, but they solved their problems by fighting. Sure. I'm, I'm happy for them. Uh, so the only other characters that we haven't really talked about yet are the Spanish. That is because they have no character. Yeah. at all like, they, they are just... like they feel like they're, they're the, the main threat in this so there's, there's three factions all trying to get to the fountain of youth you have blackbeard and his crew you have Barbosa and his crew then you have the spanish and you, no one can let the spanish get there whoever gets there first it can't be the spanish <laughs> and you have there's the spanish king uh king ferdinand who's of course one scene at the start and then you have uh, oscar uh, Janeda, Janeda, I apologize for that spelling, who is interpreted as the Spaniard, who is the king's right hand man, the most trusted agent. And he, he's capturing a ship, he's pretty badass, he gets a pretty badass line at the start when he's like, when can you sail? And he's like, on the tide. It's, it's, a, it's a nice, like, first line he says in the film, cut to credits. Or title card. That's pretty cool. But then we never spend any time with them ever again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any of there's they're sa- nothing. They're sailing, yeah, they're, they're sailing in the distance, but they they ignore Barbosa and his crew. They won't they won't uh, engage them in battle because it's they've got to get to the, the the fountain of youth. Like every time I say it, I want to call it the Holy Grail. Every time, it's, <laughs> I, I know it's not what it is, but every time I want to call it the Holy Grail. Uh, um, and then they they steal the chalice from them at one point, and then they show up at the end. But there's just no character to this place. It's like one of the great things about the previous Pirates Caribbean films is. The smaller characters, the they have, every, every crew has a couple of fun guys. They bring in something, and then there's just the Spanish. Okay, so disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> there's no life to it, you know. It's just like oh, don't forget, there's this threat. Oh, okay, and then just a bunch of mean-looking guys. And I guess maybe they want you to feel like cold and distant and not like them. But I feel liking or at least spending time with some of the minute characters for them. Ha- hope you have a better understanding of who they are so you can at least maybe kind of sympathize with them or and, have some type of like, well, maybe these guys ain't so bad. Like, something. Well, that's it. All of the characters in this film are villains to some degree. This is fine. Mm-hmm. We can we can root for those we want to. We cannot, you know, yeah. you have uh, uh, Sam Claflin and the, the mermaid, they're kind of innocents caught up in it. Uh, Jack himself is shanghai which is like a term I shouldn't use these days, uh, onto the, onto the, the ship. He gets like knocked out and wakes up on the ship, and he's been mm-hmm. he's part of the crew now. And it's happened to like scrum and as well, I guess. 
they feel like innocents, but they're also pirates. <laughs> they know what they're doing. They they roll the dice to play the game. The, the, the British can be... Ah. Maybe it's to like make the reveal at the end that they're not trying to get to the Phantom of You, they're trying to destroy it. Make keep that a secret. Like if we spent more time with them, that might have been hard to write around. But still, it just feels like a waste, like a missed opportunity that we could have had. You know, an opportunity for some uh, Spanish character actors to, to have some fun and then be on a big budget film and have some of this gargantuan uh, paycheck go their way. Uh, yeah, if you're going to make it a, a thing where there's three factions, make it a true third faction in there and then have Jack somehow end up over there for a little bit. Like, yeah, it's worked before. How many, we've had David Jones, we've had Jack, we've had Norrington, we've had a, a couple of Beckett. Like, there's always been three. There's always been three. Every time. Yeah. And, I mean, and plus even, other ships uh, that get wiped out along the way. But, okay, I'm not trying yeah. to make this film longer. <laughs> well, so long as they have their own personalities and don't kind of mimic what Cutler Beck and the others did before, like maybe the maybe when they wrote this, they thought, oh, we don't want another uh, East India Trading Company uh, like clone. So we'll just like kind of keep them at a distance. Like, no, just make them their own thing and they'll become their own thing. Like, it, it don't worry about like doing a copy paste or clone thing. Just. I don't know. Go out there and be exciting. Like it's something. Give me something fun and exciting to want to come back to this movie and watch. Because yes, the chemistry is great between Johnny Depp and Elby Cruz. Yes, Ian McShane is great. But the movie itself, if there's nothing for them to do with that greatness, then what's the sense in coming back? There's no huge, beautiful set pieces or action scenes that, you know, as soon as I close my eyes, I can relive them second by second. Like, get out of here. Yeah, I mean, speaking of not meaning to do and no reason to come back, uh, Keith Richards is also back as Captain T. Uh, but yeah, again, for what reason? Right, he he, like, he shoots a guy that's about to kill Jack, and then they have a scene in in the bar. The bar, the pub is called the Captain's Daughter, just, uh, just as Angelica is Blackbeard's daughter. Like, okay, first draft uh, naming of this pub, but fine. <laughs> uh, and so he he has that scene where ah, there is the ritual, and this is the first of. 87 times the ritual is what it laid out in this film. We do not need him at all. Uh, he, he has a nice joke. Like, does this face look like it's seen the, the Fountain of Youth? I, I, I like that. He's, you know, acknowledging that he looks uh, like a tree. Uh, but he uh, just... It, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's a real odd. Like, we didn't need him to come back. I, I hope he's not in the next one. No, it's uh, just... It's one of those things where... At first, I'm like, is this going to be a thing where there's just rolling cameos all the way through? But they kind of just pile it all up front and then don't really address or talk about any of that stuff ever again. Yeah. Uh, I've checked. He's not in the next one. Wonderful. Uh, so that's, that's something to look forward to. <laughs> okay. So you, you mentioned there not being any kind of set pieces that stay out in your mind. But uh, are there any – did you have any – Plot highlights or any like scene highlights? We, we, we've talked a little bit about the there's the escape chase through London, there's the the mermaid attack. Any, anything jumping out at you? I mean, one thing I did enjoy, I did enjoy when they're walking through that gallery of all the ships and bottles. I thought that was pretty neat because you can look at some of these bottles and determine like, oh, you know, this would have been, uh, you know, Viking pirates, and you know, you try to come up with a backstory or something like that. Just just something that all of a sudden felt like exciting and different and fun to see and visually appealing. And it was, I feel like it was also just like the right amount of time too, because with some scenes like that, you could really just kind of linger and wait and draw it out. And then it loses the magic and allure. But I, I don't know, like the bottle scene, like it, that was really cool to me. Yeah. I, I, that's a fun aspect. I, I like, I, I, I hope that the next one pays off on that, and at the end of this film, Jack and Gibbs have the, the pearl in a bottle. We don't know how to get it out. I hope that in the next film, they haven't just got the pearl back, but they actually explain. Like, so how did you get out of the bottle? What happens there? Maybe show us that. It feels like it, it could be mythology that they just kind of gloss over. I hope they acknowledge it, and I hope that if Barbosa is back in the next one, that he has Blackbeard's powers still. <laughs> he has this giant flamethrower ship. 
that the when the when we find out the ship has a flamethrower, it's like a a, a dragon boat, I guess. When uh, they have the mutiny and the guy will watch, it's sent out on his little boat. And they give him a few minutes and then they just set fire to him. That was a pretty cool sequence that I didn't see. Like, what's going to happen here? Oh, I see. It's there's a giant it's... flamethrower in the front of the ship. It's weird because when it happened, I thought I would be more excited than what I was, but I was just like, oh, who cares? Like, I, mean, it, I, I it, don't know what it was. It should be the coolest thing, a pirate ship shooting flames like a dragon, but I, I just didn't care. It's, it's a wooden pirate ship shooting flames like a dragon as well. Ah, oh, this could go very badly wrong. <laughs> uh, They're taking some serious <laughs> risks. But I guess it's, the, it's like the other uh, weapon that's been discharged from ships before is a kraken, and you can't really... Get much better than that, I guess. So yeah, it's, it's true. A step, it's a step down from the Kraken, the actual Kraken <laughs> uh, we've seen before. Uh, so that's, that's something I liked. Uh, something I really didn't like was when they find uh, Ponsiglion's uh, ship, which in the research for this I found, hey, that's not just one word. Uh, Ponce de Leon. It's not? Is, <laughs> no, it's... it's <laughs> hot, uh, uh, P O N C E space D E space L E O N Ponce de Leon, which I've always re- written down as Ponce de Leon. With one one thing, <laughs> oh, he was a guy. Uh, um, when they find uh, his ship and they're trying to find the chalice, is Jack and Bobo are in there, and the ship is precariously balanced, and so they have to stay, they have to like keep balancing out. It's like, have you seen National Treasure two? Uh, yes, but it's been a little bit. Okay, there's a scene in that where there's a platform. That's kind of balanced in the middle, and so you have uh, Nick Cage, Justin Bartha, uh, uh, Diane Kruger, and Ed Harris, like uh, balancing on that platform. And they 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 need to go all to one side so that one corner lifts up, and then that will get to a, a ladder. But someone has to stay behind. But unfortunately, uh, Justin Bartha, Riley, his character has a human-sized backpack, and so they can slide that down and add to the weight. It's it's a fun sequence. I love the scene. We talked about it a little while ago on the show. Um, Reminded me of that, except for I like that scene. And here, I did, I, this is kind of not a lot of fun. Because I'm on, on this boat, and we've got to keep balance when we look for the chances. But they they don't stay balanced at all. It's, they're moving around all over the place. Uh, it's, it's It doesn't pay off at all. And I really feel like for the budget that this film has, we should have seen that ship fall off and be a giant action set piece of the ship plummeting down and them inside it or running away from it or something. Yeah, just... I still, I still yeah. don't understand this budget. This ridiculous budget. This film has. It's bizarre. Yeah. So, uh, but I did like the moment attack. I, I um, as as dark and murky and difficult to see as it is. Mermaid monsters are pretty cool. No, it's a quite. We we like sea beasts on this show. This is what we get at sea beasts with this time. They're mermaids. They're like killer mermaids. They have teeth, and so that's that's fun. Uh, Turn into like piranha people almost. Yeah. Which we love, we love the Piranha films. Apart from Three D, <laughs> we love the Piranha movies. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them, some of them, it's great. Oh, yeah. uh, trying to think of more things I like about this film. <laughs> try anything I like it. Any, just go through my notes and see something. Uh, oh, uh, um, this isn't sorry. I like uh, Blackbeard. His his like main crew on his ship are zombies. Well, he has like zombified henchmen. Mm-hmm. Which I feel like also have they don't do enough with that. They don't do enough with uh, one of them, the quartermaster, can see the future a little bit. Uh, how? No, okay. Uh, what, what can he see? Oh, because the, the, there's a uh, the reason that, that Blackbeard's trying to find the Phantom of Youth is because there's a prophecy that he's going to be killed in two weeks by a one-legged man. Wouldn't you know? Barbosa now has one leg, uh, where the peg is full of. And I oh. feel like he's scared of this prophecy, so to. Uh, counteract this prophecy, he is going on a myth, which presumably is also part of the prophecy. Like whatever he does, is still going to be within. If you believe in the prophecy, you believe in the prophecy, and it's going to happen. There's mm. nothing you can do to prevent that happening. It's just gonna. It's just. Gonna, it's like fate. It's destiny. It's going to happen. And and so do you, you believe in it or you don't. Either way, it's, it doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah, it, it just it it just becomes disappointing because the film has so much potential to become so memorable, to become that 
outlier of like, man, outside of the trilogy, like this film really set the tone or really set just something. But we don't get that. Instead, we just get something that's wholly forgettable, truly unremarkable, like the, just just nothing. And it's so disappointing. Yeah. And then just to spend some time at the, the Fountain of Youth at the end, they find the Fountain of Youth because they go into a cave and Jack sees there's some water dripping upwards. A cool effect. I liked that. That was a nice little moment. And then the, he says he says the words written on the chalices and it conjures up the the waters flow up around them and from a pool above them. And I'm like, how the hell am I supposed to work out how deep this is when there's water <laughs> above them? This is do they not know what I'm trying to do here? Uh, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> genuine concern I have. <laughs> um. Uh, but he he manages to he stands on Scrum's back, pokes a hot in, into the water with a, his sword. The sword gets sucked through, and then he gets sucked through into this mystical magical land where the Fountain of Youth is. And then everyone else gets pulled through after him, uh, leaving no one behind. I feel like someone should they had to stand on someone to get get over who was left behind. So who did they stand on? And yeah. what I wanted to know is how did anyone get out of this place? Is is this place? Like underwater somehow, submerged in that pool? Is that just some kind of portal that goes through somewhere else on land? You can just kind of walk out of it. It's just a secret. Because we see everyone go in, does anyone get out? Did everyone go through? Did, did Barbosa and his crew and then the Spanish all go through that exact same pl- place? Like, I, I want to know. I want to see these things. We, we only see Jack go through and everyone else is just, everyone else just kind of up. Like at, at the end, where did they go? How do they get out? I, I think it's a just a portal to like another plane of existence, if you will, and then it just allows them to get back. And some people, I guess, they just forget about because they're not on the poster of the movie, or they're <laughs> like, "Ah, eh, it's getting long. Let's just go ahead and wrap this one up." Yeah, I, I think you're right. There is no satisfying answer. I just sort of thinking, ah, oh, so that's how they get in. But hmm, uh, and then it when when. Jack tricks them and he puts the the tear in one goblet and the no tear in, in the other one and he t- he tells them it's the other way around knowing that Blackbeard's going to drink the wrong thing. It's just the most obvious. Kind of oh yeah, thing. yeah. It's, it no... felt incredibly obvious. I'm like, we're we're not supposed to be surprised, right? Like this is. Wait, the bad guy did something wrong. No. Wait, what? Uh... Uh, so yeah, this is uh, for me the, the the worst of them so far. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was intensely disappointed, and even my wife was like, "I'm pretty sure that's the terrible one." I'm like, "No, I feel like I this one so. it's not so bad." And then, <laughs> God, I hope this is the terrible one. <laughs> uh, we'll see how the next one goes. Yeah, yeah. So we have one one more to go. Uh, depending on where you live, Salazar's Revenge or Dead Men Tell No Tales covering next month but did you have any any other thoughts on this one before we uh, uh, at, set sail and never think about it again at times the film felt almost like a prequel uh in the way it was kind of set up in the way that johnny depp approached jack sparrow i felt like this iteration of jack sparrow had a lot more like energy and pep and just a little a little more sane he wasn't as like loose on rum and kind of like all over the place. I don't know. He just felt a little more youthful uh, than the previous sparrows. So at times, I don't know. It felt like a, a precursor of, and and but maybe that's just me. But I just feel like it wasn't the same Jack Sparrow that we had, you know, prior. Well, speaking of rum, uh, this evening I am enjoying uh, a nice two swallows spice rum because there is. You have Penelope Cruz is playing some other Jack Sparrow, so there's two sparrows and having two swallows. That's what okay. I did here. Uh, which is, this is they, my, uh, my favorite rum. Two swallows. Go around. Cool. European or African swallows? Uh, I, I don't know. What? <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> so, do you want to know how is Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides similar to Deep Blue Sea? I would love to. This Great. is going to be my favorite part of the show. <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, there is a, a main religious character played by Sam Clarkson. Uh, he's a preacher of some kind. Okay, and that's Excellent. different. That's Did... when's the last time that one had a, a correlation? You know, it's uh, been a while. I I feel like there's some kind of correlation between the Fountain of Youth and a cure for Alzheimer's, kind of trying to prolong life. Mm-hmm. 
No, okay, okay, okay. That's uh, a half a, rhyme. A chef is involved in a fireball because the, wow, the, okay. the guy, <laughs> the guy who was uh, flamethrowered, was the sh- the chef who was one on watch and preacher. <sighs> Plays up a chuck. Uh, there's there's killer monsters in the water. The mermaids. Uh, people falling in water from a small boat. Uh, Sam Claflin has a cross necklace. In fact, half the cast has a cross necklace. Uh, <laughs> explosions in the water. A boat explodes. There's a big explosion. There's a high dive into the water. Uh, Barbosa has a perilous survival story, just like Russell Franklin does. About the, the sinking of the Black Pearl. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, there is a daughter with a dying father. So we, all, all we hear all the time about Saffron Bar is having to tell her dad that her mama died again and again and again because he's aging and uh, Blackbeard's dying. And it's directed by a guy who made a movie set in a prison. It's really hard and directed prison. Okay. In Rob Marshall directed Chicago in 2002. It's a short list. There's, there's, you know, it's not a long, these aren't long lists on these films. But but they're unique. They are. Uh, we had you know one, what I mean? They're a little bit different. We had one uh, recently for, for Carry On Cruising uh, with Rebecca <laughs> Sharp. Uh, we had uh, uh, instructions on how to cook an omelette in both films. There you go. Okay. <laughs> That's come up one time so far. Uh, but the last thing to do is how deep and how blue is Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides? So, Nick, as you know, Deep Blue Sea is about 14.5 metres deep, 31% blue. And the other Pirates of the Caribbean films, uh, Curse of the Black Pearl, about point, it's about a foot and a half up in the air. Uh, Dead Man's Chest is, uh, ooh, what's it going to be? Uh, 23 feet up in the air. I'm convinced from metric. And uh, World's End is about a foot up in the air. And uh, Blueness, they are ranging from 19 to 29% blue. Do you think On Stranger Tides is deeper and or bluer than Deep Blue Sea and the rest of the Pirates franchise so far? What do you think? I th- I think this is the shallowest and least blue of the Pirates films. Uh, you are correct in one count. It is the second shallowest. Dead Man's Chest is... Fire, because uh, all that stuff that happens up on the mountain. Oh yeah, on the face. cliff. That's right. Oh, there, so there is still some high stuff in here because there's a bunch of scenes where Jack just climbs stuff and has to dive off of stuff. Like, um, uh, <laughs> so yeah, this works out being about two point two three meters up in the air, which is uh, what is that? That's about uh, seven seven point three feet up in the air. And blueness. This is the least blue. Seventeen point three five percent blue. The next bluest was. Curse of Black Pearl, 19.45. This would have been bluer if it wasn't just so dark everywhere all the time. Yes. And and I'm watching this going, I'm like, this ain't blue at all. <laughs> I mean, th- those dark scenes accounted for a lot of the blueness because it's all like dark blue. But then there's so much that's just set in murky gray London and mm-hmm. uh, torch, uh, uh, fire lit in- interiors. Caverns and yeah. Uh, so uh, depth wise, this is. Uh, hmm. Because we're talking about heights. This is higher than the lighthouse, uh, but less high than Muppet Treasure Island. Uh, so it's our 50, 58th deepest film, or shallowest film. Mm. And blueness, it is bluer than, sorry, it's less blue than Tremors, bluer than Godzilla vs. Spirelante. So we're next to two of your films, <laughs> Muppet Treasure Island and Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> um, our, 44, our 43rd bluest film. It's like we were unfortunately meant to watch this movie. <laughs> I think so. But also, you are our most frequent guest, so we're always going to be close to films that you've covered. This is that's also true. Twelfth time you've been on the show. Uh, so... <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Yeah. I have a tally. Sorry, no. It's... Your thirteenth time you've been on the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no. This is your fourteenth. Thirteenth. Of... Yeah, what? This is your fourteenth no. time. Yep. Can you name the films you've covered? <laughs> No way. Jesus. <laughs> uh, so you were on, you were on, you did the whole Deep Sea trilogy, obviously. Uh, you're on, you're twice. actually on twice for Deep Sea 2. Yeah. Uh, you bookended that one. Uh, so that's that's four. You then joined us for the Deep Sea character draft. Oh, uh, so that's yeah. five. Yeah. And then you've done nine Deep Sea adjacent oh, films. Oh my gosh. Uh, you did Shark Knight 3D. Yep, fun. You, you then came back for the Shark Knight 3D music video. That's two separate things. Uh, Godzilla vs. Mm-hmm. Biodante. Mm-hmm. Primal. 
Muppet Treasure Island, and so far, four Pirates of the Caribbean films. Wow. Wow. Yep, okay. our most frequent guest. Um, second is Megan Hoffmeyer. She's been on six times. So you have more than double. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that is Mark's wife. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Oof. <clears throat> Stan, you're coming back next month for Pirates of the Caribbean. Dead Men Tell No Tales, Salazar's Revenge, Dead Men Tell, Salazar's Revenge, No Tales. Uh, we'll That's, start we'll that is that true. Uh, and then um, you'll come back again at some point. I have a request to make to you after that one. Uh, which Ooh, okay, I'm it. for it. You, know, you shouldn't look forward to it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Shanghai you into it. Um, but yeah, do you, I mean, that, that'll do it for uh, 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 on Stranger Tides. I'll lose this episode yet, I think. Uh, wow. Do you have anything you want to plug? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just want to plug rabbitholepodcast.com. Uh, check out the two programs that I am featured on, Lyrical Innuendo, Bubba Wheat, and I tag along as co-host. And the newer of the two, Play MST for me, that features Jason Soto, and I tag along for that as well. Excellent. And you can find everything Mark does over at moviesfilmsandflicks.com. Uh, you can find my writing over at lifeversusfilm.com. You can follow this podcast on all social media at Deep Blue Sea Pod. I say all social media. Uh, the social media I've set up. If, if it's if, you know, it's not on TikTok, uh, but it's on a bunch of places. So if you, you go there, search Deep Blue Sea Pod. If it shows up, great. If not, we're not there. Uh, let us know if you'd like us to be else some places that we're not. Uh, and next week, I think, yeah, this is coming out mid October. So next week, Mark's back for the Deep House, an underwater haunted house film that's just come out on Netflix. That came out a couple of years ago in you know outside Netflix. But now I can watch it. Uh, so the Deep House. <laughs> and we are our Halloween episode for this year. But as for Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides, thank you once again to my guest Nick Rehack. Thank you for having me on, man. I've been Jay Clue, and I'll deep blue see you next week. Savvy? 